I'm Leo Water for Kick Guru. This is Leo Says. The idea is that I see things in the news, see what I think about them, tell you what I think, then you tell me how I'm wrong, and then we proceed from there. It's called a conversation. It's really quite good. Uh, first item of the news, net neutrality. This has been sloshing around recently, lots of stuff going on. But it's mainly in the USA, which is kind of fair enough in the sense the internet is the USA and all the big tech companies are in the USA, apart from the ones that are in China. Uh, we Europeans don't really have much of a look in. Uh, so in a sense, we're just passengers on this whole thing. Uh, but uh, the, the seems to be a th view which is net neutrality is a good thing because, you know, freedom and all traffic is equal. And there you go. And balanced against that, you've got those uh, sort of uh, little uh, tiny little companies, uh, Google and Facebook and such like, complaining they might be uh, looked on harshly by Comcast and Verizon and people like that, if those are American companies. Uh, you understand we don't have those ISPs over here. Uh, and they might therefore throttle the bandwidth required by YouTube uh, in order that uh, their own uh, cable TV gets piped down with priority. Well, yeah, I suppose. Uh, and yet I find it very hard to get hot under the collar. And I appreciate there's a certain irony, which is that this is a YouTube video, which is, you know, being from one of those companies being broadcast, depending on where you are, over the pipe zone by those people. But uh, here in the UK and across most of Europe, it's a slightly different story because we, we have generally more ISPs. In the UK, we tend to only have three in any one area, which is a bit awkward. But uh, Europe seems to do slightly better. But how many networks? and such like you've got available is a big deal and if you've got four you've got competition if you've got three it's iffy if you've got two well that's not good and if you've got one you're knackered and um, by the sound of it the americans uh, in various states actually have it real bad uh, you can have one decent network or some shonky ones so i have to view this um net neutrality from the let through the lens rather of uh, us europeans where it doesn't seem to be a problem and i really do have a well, I actually think it's a bit hypocritical, actually, for the likes of Facebook and uh, Google to say, oh, we need to be supported. We need to be able to pipe our stuff down the pipes at uh, the fastest possible speeds, particularly when it's Facebook. I mean, look at what they send out. But uh, yes, I, th I think this one's one of those ones we have a dividing line. Uh, Americans up in arms over it. Europeans, not so much. Uh, and the instinct is to say, well, net neutrality must be good. Freedom, you know. Uh, and yet, you know, freedom for what? Facebook and Twitter? Hmm. I remain to be convinced. And after that lack of intelligence, there's some artificial intelligence. Uh, we have a story today, which is that uh, NVIDIA, who are the kings of uh, GPUs for artificial intelligence and machine learning, have just released some software that allows people involved in machine learning, so big industry stroke data people stroke scientists, to do uh, machine learning at home, to write code at home uh, and run it on their Titan. Uh, Titan graphics card um, because Titan in in the world of machine learning is a puny little graphics card uh, and you want to really run it on a whole bank of V100s uh, you know Volters uh, at uh, work so the idea is you can now run machine learning type stuff on uh, Titan well okie dokie now there was a story the other day about Google successfully created a system which in turn created a system which could identify photos so it's you know, Skynet. I mean, all the headlines are saying Skynet, and and clearly it's heading that way. Except it hasn't got any guns. Uh, instead, this software can identify um, from pictures what's going on. So, uh, what percentage uh, likelihood is that that over there along that beach is a person? What if it's a kite? Is it a dog? And so on and so forth. It's all clever stuff, but absolutely terrifying. So I asked Nvidia, uh, what is there in the way of regulation on artificial intelligence? Because we've got regulation. If you want to brew up some biological viruses at home or go around snipping DNA out of creatures and such like there are rules in place uh, and there is stuff to do with what you can do in laboratories and what you can do in the wild uh, artificial intelligence honestly I had absolutely no idea what the situation was and I sent a link by uh, the relevant person in video and it was to a House of Lords committee here in the UK we've got two chambers of parliament as so many nations have uh, our House of Commons is the parliamentarians who we elect the House of Lords are the unelected types in other places it might be called a senate uh, and uh, the House of Lords they're funny people uh, so there's an awful lot of them many of them are very old been around a long time however included in their ranks are some uh, esteemed scientists so if you get a good House of Lords committee it can be really good uh, but they're not really very speedy that would be the word not speedy uh, so the idea that the things standing between myself and my fellow Brits uh, and Skynet is uh, a House of Lords committee 
Honestly, it does not reassure me. It really does not. But there we go. Security. Um, the other week I was saying that, uh, more British government, uh, that uh, the British government or somebody within the British government uh, had told various government departments not to use Kaspersky uh, security software because, you know, it's Russian. And it seemed like, well, OK, uh, but why? Uh, and the story behind it, I've done some reading, is... A bloke in America who works for the NSA doing hacking type tools and so on and so forth was in the habit of taking his work home with him. I think you can see where this is going. Uh, so he took his work home and in time his work found its way into the hands of either the Russians or um, uh, WikiLeaks, um, one or the other, uh, or both. And then it was leaked. Uh, I presume it's part of that uh, vault uh, release of all those hacking tools. And it turns out the guy has Kaspersky uh, security software on his home machine. So uh, the connection that's being made is that that was how his machine was attacked. It seems that this NSA hacker, that his home machine was actually riddled with malware, uh, which makes you wonder if he was uh, targeted himself. But um, ironic, no? Anyway... Kaspersky has completely denied any involvement in this to say it's nothing to do with them. Yes, it's their security software on the machine, but that's it. They have nothing to do with the Russian government. Uh, they're not doing bad things. You can trust them. To which I say, well, OK, I mean, yeah, fine. But, you know, so, hmm. Well, where does the irony end? NSA hacker who creates tools to hack things is hacked. And it turns out he uses Kaspersky. I mean, really? Is that the best he could do? Not even Sophos? I, I, actually, words fail me. I don't know what to say. Anyway, but that's the background to this story. Two other, three other things, three other things. We got Intel, we got AMD, but we got Seasonic. Seasonic Prime Titanium 600 Watt Fanless Power Supply. A, a stellar piece of hardware. It's just been reviewed on KitGuru. It scored 10 out of 10. That's the reason why it's made, Leo says. Uh, because in the past, KitGuru has awarded 10 out of 10 to a pair of headphones and now to the 600 Watt Fanless Power Supply. Truly, truly a top-notch piece of kit. And the thing is, it's semi-affordable. I mean, it's 200 pounds, which is quite pricey. But we're not talking 500 or 750. We're talking 200. So if you want a 600 watt power supply, you can buy this. And the thing is, 600 watts is grunty enough that it can power an awful lot of PCs. I'm waiting to use my 600 watt fanless on a Threadripper system with a GTX 80Ti just to see whether or not it can keep that system going under extreme load. I'm hoping it can. I think it should be able to. I think I'll be in the 500 and something watt territory. Uh, in which case, powering a system with a passive power supply, passively cool power supply. I like that idea a great deal. And of course, the reason it can run passively cool is because it's so blooming efficient. Uh, a top-notch piece of hardware. Well done, Seasonic. You thoroughly deserve that award. Really impressed. And then we have two other things. OK, so the AMD thing. James Pryor of AMD. Uh, I met James in Los Angeles a few months ago at an AMD event when they were doing uh, Threadripper and Vega and all sorts of bits and pieces. Uh, and James is on the CPU side of things, so he didn't get... Uh, he didn't get covered in the Vegas uh, in the Vegas stink. Let's say, let's be uh, polite. Uh, and James actually ran the deep dive on Threadripper, uh, answering questions from the press. So he knows his stuff about Threadripper, and basically he knows his stuff about Zen. So uh, during this uh, Facebook interview with Overclockers, he said. There are a number of things he didn't say, but the things he did say that Vega 11 graphics core and James's CPU, not GPU, is not going to be a discrete GPU. It is part of the Raven Ridge APU for Ryzen Mobile. So if you get a proper AMD laptop uh, in the coming months, uh, the graphics in that ought to be Vega 11. So not exciting news. Uh, really looking forward to seeing Ryzen Mobile in action, actually, and hopefully CES uh, in just a few weeks' time. It will be up and running. Certainly ought to be. Uh, we got some naming, so just confirmation that uh, the die shrink, the small die shrink using um, 12 nanometer LP for Zen, that's going to be called Zen Plus. And the big one, the big die shrink that's coming in the future is Zen 2. But the thing that James brought to it is that AMD is supporting AM4 through 2020, we know that, and that both Zen Plus and Zen 2 should, in inverted commas, both work on existing AM4 motherboards with a BIOS update. Uh, his precise wording was, 
In a perfect world, the new processor just drops in with a BIOS flash, which is really good news. Uh, I went back to AMD PR because, I mean, the guy was being asked questions on camera and sometimes you say things you don't necessarily exactly mean. I asked AMD's PR just to give me an actual statement on this and they said very similar words. They said, we plan to support AM4 for several years and generations of products. We will be sharing more info about Ryzen desktop processors in the new year. And of course, CES is just in the new year. It's in the first week of uh, January. So that all ties in very nicely. So that's feeling and looking good um, with that in a perfect world. But let's hope the world is perfect. Uh, but that would be real good. And then there's a leak from Intel. It's a slide from a roadmap. It's been all around the web, all the usual websites, including Kit Guru. A couple of significant points that came off it. Uh, the first is uh, actually a bit of a surprise. So there's a Z390 chipset for Coffee Lake, but also B360. Well, okay, so as a model code, doesn't really matter, but they're proper Coffee Lake chipsets. Uh, but the thing was, they're only showing two, four, and six core Coffee Lake processors, no mention of eight core. That does not mean there will not be an eight core Coffee Lake. Uh, I'll be stunned if it's not an eight core. The implication is that uh, Intel will release eight core if they feel the need to respond to AMD further. Uh, as things stand, who knows? So the fact it doesn't show eight core does not mean there will not be an eight core uh everything we've been told from rumors uh, suggests there will be probably in the middle of the year you think for computex but it was not on that roadmap and that is a surprise what was on the roadmap was a thing showing that uh sky lake x and cable lake x will be followed by uh Cascade Lake X in Q4 2018, so one year's time. And there was speculation that Cascade Lake X will use 14 nanometer plus plus. This is the HEDT, a uh, high end uh, desktop, um, which is uh, X99 and X299. Now, the thing is, Cascade Lake X is not, or Cascade Lake, um, is not a code name with which I was familiar. I had to look it up because if it's a ice lake or some such, you think, well, that's the next desktop thing. But the fact is 40 nanometer plus plus apparently rather than 10 nanometer puts uh, the mockers on that. And Cascade Lake uh, is due to be a revision of the existing Intel Xeon processor scalable, which is a whole family of Xeons. They go from, I believe, four core at the bottom end, certainly six or eight core, all up to 28 core, massive, massive range of silicon, and therefore inside it, different bits of silicon. And Cascade Lake X is going to be a refresh of this, or oh, sorry, Cascade Lake will be a refresh, then Cascade Lake uh, X will be the uh, high-end desktop version of Cascade Lake. The significant thing is that Cascade Lake is going to introduce Optane DIMMs. Uh, it doesn't actually appear to be a big change to uh, Intel Xeon processor scalable other than those Optane DIMMs, which Intel is calling Intel persistent memory. Uh, so Cascade Lake for Xeons, it'll be interesting to see how those Optane DIMMs work out. Um, you'd think horribly expensive, but hopefully also very fast. And then you have to wonder whether Cascade Lake X will bring Optane DIMMs, Intel Persistent Memory, to the desktop. If so, that would be a big change. Intel's done this before with memory, and they bring out a whole new memory type, and you go, ooh, here we go. You know, RDRAM comes to mind a long time ago now. Uh, but that's pure speculation. Just because Cascade Lake introduces a certain type of memory does not mean that Cascade Lake only supports that type of memory. We will have to see how that one shakes out and then see what comes with Cascade Lake X. But... Uh, that sounds potentially interesting, but the fact it's a whole year away, and obviously Intel can pull things in or push them back, uh, means it's not going to happen anytime soon. So for the time being, it's certainly X299 is where we're at in the existing platform. Nonetheless, if Optane DIMMs is coming our way, I want to see how they work. If you like this video, thumbs up. If you don't, thumbs down. If you want more from KitGuru, click to subscribe. I'm Leo Waldock. This is Leo Says.